determine colours. The three is more about binocularity and disparity in our vision. So really you can see there's a complex architecture here that is really needing to bind together to allow you to very capably perceive that per set that's presented to you in matters of microseconds. And no machine has yet been able to recapitulate this. So we heard a little bit about evolution and how, you know, how fast it is and how perhaps an iPad's increased our intelligence. But let's go one step back to how biology in itself has actually increased our intelligence. What you're seeing up here is the brain, as well as cortex from a rat, a cat, and among a human, okay? Now these three group areas, the large blobs, relate to the primary areas of each of the senses, so that first input from the sensory organ. So so matter sensory being our hands for touch, say, visual being the organ being the eye, and auditory being the ear. As you can see, these are moulded quite close together. But as species have expanded and evolved, we've actually seen that the areas in between these primary areas have actually increased as well, till we get up to, say, the human, and there's a vast separation between the primary areas of, say, the primary visual area and the primary somatosensory area. And this is a very interesting concept to me, because I'm also particularly interested in the evolution. Why, as the species has evolved, hasn't there just been an expansion in the size of these areas? What has enabled us is the fact that we've been able to implant secondary areas into the cortex. So what we call the association areas for each of those senses. And so there's been an expansion, but not just a simple expansion in these big, large areas to keep the system basic, but just a bit more capable. And what we've seen is an ability to process colour and process motion more capably. So this is very interesting. This is one of the primates I work with, and this is the marmoset monkey, which is a small new world monkey. And as you can see, it has 20 visual areas that we can actually map on the surface of its brain, compared to a rodent, which there's still debate about how many. This is a mouse that has between six and seven. So that whole concept, how did this happen? How did the inclusion of the additional areas occur has been quite interesting to science in the last few years. What we're starting to understand is that during development, there's actually been an expression map of different molecules that underpins this whole expansion. But as we've evolved, we've seen what the, the mo molecule name doesn't really matter, but within these regions, we get expression of guidance cues. They're like a map. So before the brain actually develops in a, that early phase, there's actually an outlying map of areas. And we're starting to understand which of those molecules are actually associated with that. Some very clever experiments have been performed as well. So what you can actually do is to artificially, ectopically, it cause the expression of a molecule in another area. And this was actually done in the mouse. So this is the mouse barrel field cortex. So each one of these little dots that you see relates to one of the fist whiskers on its face. What they were able to do is actually mimic and actually mirror that by actually causing the expression of those molecules in an adjacent era, area. So it actually ends up with two of these kind of areas. So we're starting to understand the concept of the molecular technology. So that's really about the evolution of the system one of the other concepts that really doesn't get talked about much, and this is what you have to think about in the technology of an advancement of a system, is that the development of the system requires many years in instruction. We have a very plastic brain for many years to allow us to have that true possession of interconnectivity. And this is, I think, something that's very much forgotten, especially in the artificial intelligence world, is about plasticity and also that requirement that there's multiple years in which we actually require to develop. And it's not just singular as one wave and it's all developed. So I'm just going to give you a few examples to help you actually understand this point a little bit more. So 
One of the first tests that's always done on children when they're born in a few months is what we call the visual cliff test. This is one of the first tests that you can actually do in neonatology to see that the brain is processing vision appropriately. And what it has is a checkerboard cloth and then a perspex sheet. And what should happen is the child should actually come up, crawl up to the end, look down, and then actually perceive that there's actually depth there and not progress any further. So that's one of the first actual modalities of vision that is actually processed early in life that we can actually prove. When we think of vision, it's quite the visual system has actually set itself up quite cleverly to reduce that amount of processing power required as well. So we have actually, from that primary visual area I was talking to you about, we actually have two streams, which are quite simple to understand. One goes up to the dorsal part of the brain, one down to this ventral. This part's associated with where an object is and motion detection, where this area down here is about what the object is. Now, in this region, right in your temporal lobes, that's where you do all your face recognition. So people that can't recognise faces actually have a disorder called prosopagnosia, and some of you may have heard of people with that. And that takes 11 years to fully develop. We don't see the maturation of these areas until around 11 years of age. Whereas more importantly for us in terms of evolution and our ability to survive is about detecting friend and foe and being able to run away and detect things. So that's why we've been able to identify that these two streams of information processed at different, although parallel in many ways, have very different times of development. And the classic example for this was actually, I'll go through a case study here, is a guy called Mike May. Now Mike May had an accident in his chemistry class at school at the age of six and he had burnt his corneas, so he had bilateral corneal abrasions and he was left blind, so retinally blind. However, at the age of 45, he was able to receive corneal transplants because of course that's quite a common transplant surgery nowadays. But interestingly, when they came to analyze him afterwards, he'd been a downhill skier even though he was blind, he was a Paralympian, and he was much better now, of course, at being able to move around and perceive motion. However, when it came to the fact that could he recognise faces, no. So what, he couldn't recognise his wife, so she'd come in, she'd speak, he'd recognise her, she'd leave, and then come back in again, and he couldn't recognise her. Now, for some of you, you might think that that was probably a good idea, a good thing, but for him, he found it wasn't. He couldn't recognise his own son. So this sort of suggests to us that there is a level of plasticity early in the brain. And what we've been able to learn from this is the fact that when he received his lesions, this pathway through here was actually hardwired and couldn't be changed. Whereas this pathway was much more in that plastic phase still and was actually rewired. And they've actually shown more recently with other technologies, so like you know, functional magnetic resonance imaging, that this is actually being taken over by the auditory cortex, so actually hears in this region now. So, quite a strange phenomenon. So, what actually happens when individual areas of the visual cortex are damaged following an injury? And this is very common, we see it all the time in the clinic with stroke. And what is so useful about this is brain damage actually gives us a window of opportunity to go in and observe the way the brain deals with processing information. So we all detect motion very easily, like this is biological motion which is a few dots and you can all just, you can all tell me what this guy is doing, can't you? So what, sitting down, yeah? Jumping, really cool. Yeah, climbing the stair, just from a few dots. Typical Aussie, opening a can of beer but we can all see it, pre-wired to open the can of beer. So that's how capable we are of detecting motion, just through that biological motion of a few dots. In terms of vision, it's con we can see that huge effect that it actually has on our behaviour, the integration of the systems. So these are not specific to one visual cortical area, but more global. And the most classical one is where you get visual hemi-neglect. 
where we see this a lot in the clinic following stroke, where a patient can only identify one half of an image. So they actually see the whole image, but when you ask them to copy it, they will only draw half of the image. And they, when they recognize, they cannot recognize objects. So this guy is seeing it as a telephone when it's actually a lock. So those are the kinds of um, lesions we see in the clinic. When we look more specifically, though, at cases where individuals have had one specific cortical area ablated, it actually becomes much more interesting. So I told you a little bit earlier on, there's one of those areas in that visual cortex called the middle temporal area, and that's involved in processing emotion. Now, this poor lady, a Dutch woman, patient GN, she's actually had a bilateral lesion to her area MT. And what I'm going to show you here is how she actually perceives her everyday life. So you can see her, she's pouring a cup of tea, but it really is rendered a, st a composite of static images. So she's not getting that fluid motion that we can actually perceive. So pouring a cup of tea, it eventually overflows, of course. Going back, this is again, if we look on the surface of the brain, that's where this area of MT actually is. But again, this is how she actually perceives crossing the road. So of course it's incapable. The cars are presented in junctions of a static images. So there's no smooth pursuit of that visual motion. So making a life, of course, is very difficult to live. But this is one of the cases in which we were actually able to understand about visual lesions and their effect on the brain. However, I'm going to talk to you now about one more that's probably the most interesting in all of these. Because you would think, wow, if you have a stroke and you take out your primary visual cortex, this is an MRI image of a patient of ours, and he's actually lost all of his primary visual cortex at the back here from a stroke. But some of these patients have some very strange phenomena. So what you've got to understand is if you take out that primary input from the eye, it leaves you blind. Yep. So this patient is a patient TN. He had a bilateral lesion at the age of 50, of V1, so he was left blind. Now this guy, Larry Weiskrantz, a colleague from Oxford, asks him to walk down the centre of this obstructed corridor and you watch what happens. So he, Larry says, I'll guide you if you're going to trip or anything, but just walk down the centre of the corridor. As you can see, he's quite capably avoiding the obstacles, isn't he? But he's blind. How is he capable of doing this? Now, Larry asked him at the end, why did you avoid all those obstacles in the corridor? What do you think he said? That's right. He said, I didn't. I walked straight down the middle of the corridor. So this has been an area of interest of research for mine now for over the last few years, is trying to <coughs> interpret what's going on here. Now we do know, actually, that a lot of us, this is actually called a phenomenon of blind sight, but we do actually know that actually we, all of us have a level of blind sight. And there's been a suggestion that blind sight is linked to the level of IQ. Now the guy that you've just actually seen, unfortunately, was a neurosurgeon. So there's a level of aptitude with these subjects that seems to be related to IQ. Now it's something that's being bounced around as super blind sight by the philosophers. But what it essentially is that we all have this level of unconscious visual processing that allows us to perform tasks in everyday life without actually having to bring them to that conscious level. Like, I think all of us have had that experience where we've been driving home from work and all of a sudden we're at home and we're like, shit, where's that last 10 minutes gone? And you haven't actually but it's because we're programming it and we don't need to bring it to the conscious level. Now we're starting to understand more about the fact that that dorsal stream I mentioned to you may be involved in unconscious vision and that ventral bit is more about conscious vision. 
So that's where a lot of the work is going. Now we know, as I said originally, that V5 is involved in motion. So this got me sort of like thinking, well, if this bit's gone, is there any way information can get up to this part of the brain without with bypassing this route? So there's been a few hypotheses found around in the journals. This is patient GY, and they've shown that information, I, I know it's rather complex to understand, but that there was a pathway from that middle part of the brain, the geniculate, to area MT. But it was a really small pathway, so people said, nah, not really, it can't, it's not big enough to actually enable that sort of level of processing. So we then went on to do a mapping study in the primate brain to see, well, are there any other alternate pathways? And from that traditional pathway, and we've recently published this in the Journal of Neuroscience and changed the textbook in the sense that we've now identified that there's actually another nucleus in the midbrain, which we call the pulvina, which means pillow, through here to this middle temporal area, which would enable that to happen. And it's very likely to allow for that. The other interesting thing is, a child that is born with one head to an adult. Now, the most amazing example of this comes from this study with a child that was actually only born with one hemisphere, but has near normal vision. How can this be? But they've started to demonstrate that there is this rerouting of information. And that this is what I come into is about that plasticity, is that during that early phase of life, the rewiring of connections is much more possible, and that there are actually are pathways established in our brain that are actually purely there for development. And during those first years of life, they get pruned back. Now, you could ask yourself, why do we need to do that? What is the reason that you have to grow connections to enable development, and then they just get removed? If we didn't have these, we believe that the brain would have to expand to 10 times its normal size to enable the true connections to be defined from the incorrect Im immature connections to prune back. So having alternate pathways through different nuclei enables us to really keep a simplistic structure early on because the energy demand, of course, to have a brain that big would not be feasible and we would die. So how we examine this plasticity of pathways is doing neural tracing, where we put traces into the brain and look at the, how the connections form. But more recently, the technology has been that we can actually use MRI. So this is a, not a clinical scanner, but an animal scanner. It's got its nine Tesla, whereas most of the ones you see in the hospital were only three. So it gives us a much higher resolution. So we can stick the animal in there. And what we can actually measure is quite simple. So Brownian motion, of course, the movement of a water molecule in a specific space and orientation. When you've got an axon, you know, that guiding fibre, it actually only has a very limited direction that the water molecule inside that can actually move. Now, we can actually detect that with the magnet, and then it probabilistically works out pathways. So what we end up with is pathways like this, where we can see, well, this is one organ in the brain going up to our green middle temporal area. So we can actually map and prove the existence of these pathways in a live subject, and we can adapt this to the humans, of course, as well. And I suppose what really comes from that, that what we've actually demonstrated, and I've put this into simple diagrams so I hope you can understand, so what we're showing here is a normal control where we have a very small pathway from our pulmonary to area MT. What we showed was that this pathway was much more important in development. Okay? So how I originally told you that there's a one primary sort of area that receives all the information from the vision is actually true in the adult. But during development, like I said, it's not possible for one area to be responsible because it's got to be a pass of information through for the development of the remaining 40 to 50 areas. So as we've evolved as a species, we've actually had to include a secondary node, which we've determined to be this middle temporal area. So these two are our anchors in development, and it simplifies the set of instructions needed. So then what we've been able to show is that this pathway 
is actually much greater in size during development. But when it gets its input from V1, it actually becomes pruned back. And there's a learning aspect to that as well. So if you remove this part of the brain in the young animal, eventually this doesn't get pruned back like it would be in an adult. So we've actually been able to show that following a lesion of this part, the important part of the brain, the visual cortex, primary visual cortex, this ability to have the huge affordability of vision following this lesion is through this pathway. So the information has been rerouted through a different mechanism. So this has really been very complex in understanding, but we really need to get these insights from plastic for our understanding of plasticity and injury. So I suppose one of the downsides of being a more complex species is the fact that plasticity is actually bad, that uncontrolled plasticity is actually bad for us in adulthood. So the fact that you know, we would actually lose memories if connections weren't hardwired and the fact that you know it's not possible for a complex system to regenerate. We're not an axolotl where you can chop its limb off and it will regrow within 24 hours. The fact is, to be a more evolved species, it's limited our ability to regenerate. But we know that that ability exists early in life. So is it possible that we could recapitulate those processes and switch back on the developmental process? So that's one of the key areas that I think we should really be focusing on. Now, the visual system is a great system in which to test a lot of this, both from an actual biological aspect and also a engineering modified artificial intelligence system, because we actually know a lot about the system. We know it's extremely highly ordered, and that's what I wanted to get through here to you today, is the fact that if you're coming from, I know many of you are coming from very different backgrounds, okay? But the fact is that it's a highly organized system, much more organized than we actually understand. So what I'm showing you here is that this is probably an experiment that was done in the 60s by a guy called Roger Tootle, who's still one of our major visual neuroscientists today. And what he did is he got monkeys to actually stare at this radial, what we call a hemifield here. And then what he did is he actually removed the brain and just put the brain in a dish and looked at that primary visual cortical area and stained it with something that actually recognises energy levels. It was called 2-deoxyglucose, but it doesn't matter. It just shows the levels of energy. And you can clearly see from this how ordered on just the surface of the brain you can actually see these lines. This is our central part of our vision, which takes up quite a large bit at the back here. And as you move through, you can see these really, the highly ordered system, which it is, within that brain. Now, people have gone on to subsequently present images and actually see the image impression on the surface of the cortex. So you're looking at individual little neurons and that, but they can actually recapitulate an image. So it really does tell you that the cortex isn't just a bunch of neurons and cells just mashed together, that there's a really high degree of order within that system as well. And that takes many, many years to develop through our developmental phase. We also can tell that if we create a lesion, say of this region here, that it creates this sort of blind spot in your visual field, which we call a scotoma. And then we can go on and test that physiologically to see where those connections which have been cut off, whether they can actually rewire and reconnect and re-establish those connections to actually remove that. So we've got a good system, a solid system, in which we can test the elements of pet repair and regeneration in the cortex, all the way through to is there a behavioural response? Because why I've sort of like been elementing and hear about one particular system, I think we have to think about that as well as if we're going to be able to create a machine that re can recapitulate vision we don't just use vision for vision alone. Vision is part of our behaviour. So it goes beyond the visual cortex, it goes into our cognitive centres of the brain where it's further integrated, where we decide what we're going to do in response to that percept. So it can't be 
an individual system. So that's what we're trying to look at as well. So many injuries, why are injuries sustained in the visual cortex likely to be less inhibiting? Now, we know through looking at these molecules that they actually enable us to actually f enable the actual repair of cells into adjacent areas. So early in life, if you have a lesion in this part of the brain, which I've just shown a zigzag cut here, the cells that are actually meant to end in there can actually go into adjacent cortex because there's signals there that are saying, come to me, come to me. However, when you've developed and your brain is mature, that doesn't exist. So you've got this whole issue as well. And I come back to this because this is something that I don't believe has actually been thought about in terms of bionic vision. Okay? So if I remove part of your visual cortex, you're actually going to lose part of your retina as well. We have a process here called valerian degeneration. What that means is, many of you will understand Hababian mechanisms, that in terms of a cell, needs to have a synapse and a contact for it to remain alive. If a cell is firing and it doesn't get a response, it says, hey, what am I doing here? I'm wasting energy, I might as well go on to a, another thing and it will die. So following a lesion of this part of the brain, we actually see degeneration in this part of the geniculate in the middle of the brain and then into the retina. So in terms of regeneration, we've got to get in there fast to immediately affect the changes following a stroke to enable the survival of these cells. Secondly, this is something they need to be thinking about in, the bio, in bionics. You know, it's not just the biology of what's happening here, it's a whole system through. So, the other thing, of course, which has really hit the debate nowadays is what about stem cells? Stem cell factories, stem cell tourism is a really big thing at the moment. A lot of people heading off to China to get embryonic stem cells thrown into their brain for Parkinson's disease. What a nightmare. What a waste of money. We don't understand what their role is yet. You know, embryonic means it's embryonic. It could become anything. Do you know what I mean? And do you want to be growing a backbone in your striatum? And essentially that's what can happen. We don't know. They can turn into osteoblasts, into anything. However, one thing that we're learning from my lab is the fact that is there potential for the brain itself to repair? Have we really given up on this and saying it's all got to be through bionics and alternate mechanisms, putting artificial structures in there to re-enable that connectivity? No, I don't think we do. We've actually demonstrated that in a primate there's a higher degree of endogenous precursor cells, their neural precursor cells, that can actually likely help the system. So what I'm showing you here is a sagittal section, so on the side view, okay, of a brain of a monkey. And this monkey's had a stroke. And what you can actually see is that there's actually all these green cells, okay? Now these green cells are actually being labelled with a drug that mimics DNA and then fluoresces. So it gets incorporated into the DNA. So what that tells us is that that cell is a dividing cell at the time of injury. And you can see the brain is populated with them. And they're actually, where the lesion is at this end of the brain, they're actually coming through to that area. They're actually migrating through. We've gone on to show that they can actually turn into neurons yet, but then they just sit there dormantly and don't become part of the network. So what we really need to do is actually switch the system on. Now, I know many of you will have this context, and I bring this to you here today, about should primates be used in biomedical research, okay? And my stand to that and to present to you today is that for the last 20 years, no rodent research has got us any closer to understanding brain injury. Over 300 different drugs have come out of those in the area of stroke and traumatic brain injury alone to the phase one clinical trials where they have all failed. So the concept of what we're delivering is, do we need to undertake this work in primates to really understand what the potential in the brain of a human or in a more complex brain is? And this is true. 
because what we're seeing here has now been observed in humans following stroke, but cannot be recapitulated in the rodent model. There does not look like there's any innate system to switch on this population of precursor cells in the rodent brain. And of course, then we lead on to machine vision. And as you know, a lot of machine vision, well, not machine vision necessarily, but machine bionics, where that interface between animal and machine has been has involved primate. I expect many of you saw the Nature paper last year where the monkey, through its own thoughts, was able to actually feed itself. Did you all see that? And, they, and they, I'd look up on Nature or Google it and there's a movie. So through the own thoughts, the monkey's arm was behind its back, it had a robotic arm, and through its own thoughts it was actually able to feed itself and drink. So that's where we have that interface. We can't do that with a less complex brain, as I demonstrated to you at the beginning. So let's think about machine vision in the last few moments. So my first take to this is that evolution, I think we forget, is a machine in itself. <coughs> and it has been refined over millennia to operate specifically for our organism and whatever organism. Like we talk about the fact that we've evolved from previous species, which is true, but there's been a lot of divergence in that pathway as well. So do we really understand those concepts? In terms of visual cortical evolution, this has been a production of a highly ordered system. And like I said to you, we don't even yet understand what each of those specific cortical areas has as its role in visual processing. We can't fully understand, with the technology we have today, how we can recognise faces. What is it that's recognised as faces? Because everyone with a child will tell you, my child recognises me at three months of age. Every time I look at it, it smiles at me, hugs me. Maybe it does to some extent, but it's just picking up those individual elements. It's not got that cognitive capacity like we do, where you can not see someone for 10 plus years, but gently you see them again, it's an immediate reaction, where that ageing of that face is morphed back to what you originally knew, and you recognise it as a friend. How is the brain doing that? That's what we have to think about. And while there's been much focus on the visual bionics, like I'm saying, this is less likely to ever generate what that brain has been able to evolve itself. And it's going to be bigger than that computer we saw at the start to actually process it, and I'm not going to be able to pull that around behind me. So, leading on to the bionic eye. Now, I'm going to say at the outset, I am not a fan of this for a number of reasons, okay? It's a great idea, bionic vision, and it sounds perfect. Now, people that were at the summit with Kevin Rudd, when he said that he was going to invest in bionic vision, you know, by 2020, 2020 vision is what you go and see when you visit the optometrist. So I think he had a little bit of a El Senior's moment there when he was deciding, why do we need to be investing in this? Now, I think what I've tried to demonstrate to you through this talk, I know it's been rather complex, but I hope you can take away. But I think it's impossible to predict that behaviour that the brain undertakes and that there's that normal level of plasticity which is different between you and me. No sane brain undergoes that level of pruning and plasticity because it's all about evolution in the sense of our own personal evolution and development as well. You don't see green the same as I see green. That's how we've evolved. You go to the hairdresser, you hear, oh, you've coloured my hair orange. No, it's not, it's red. It's because we each have our own take on separate things, whether it be colour, faces our appearance. That's all hardwired into us. We're all individuals. So is bionics going to remove that individuality of us all, I suppose? Do we all become one morphed individual? You know, it's a sense of we, what's happening with genomics and, you know, in terms of having knockouts and knock-in mice. Are we all trying to create that same individual? But our persona comes from that individual development and personality which we learn in those first few stages of life. Now, I'm just demonstrating to you, these are the two, there's one cortical implant that's been devised and which is in prototype form in the US, where you wear a camera on the top of your head, 
And also there's the bionic retinal implant here, which is for when this is very, which is being trialled for macular degeneration and AMD. So, the cases where individuals have been set up with this in the US, the first take is they hate it. It's not giving you normal vision. It's giving you an image, black and white maybe, where you can fathom out that perhaps there was a table there. But it's not a normal sense of vision. Well, that might be good enough to be able to walk around. But what the actual patients are saying is that it's an overload to their system. They hate it. It's like equivalent of someone screaming in your ear, which what happened with the first bionic ear patients. It was too much. The brain wasn't trained in this way by this bloody big bunch of electrodes shoved in it to be providing stimulation. It had a much less aggressive way of learning. What is being taken out of the equation here is that there's actually that capacity for plasticity early in life. And that's what can't be recapitulated. So you're expecting a highly ordered system, which is the brain, to process a few little electrical signals through this nail bed. That's the other thing. What's the longevity of something like this? Perhaps the brain can become plastic and enable the influence of this. But the problem there as well is the fact that over a period of time, these electrodes wear out. Our neurons are pretty good. They don't wear out as effective quickly. But we know with all the deep brain stimulators from Parkinson's disease, there's a life expectancy of this type of thing. So I think that's the other thing we've got to look at, is what do we actually put back into the system? So what I want to say from here is I think we still need to give, in terms of repair, the potential drive for the brain to repair itself and try and do as much as we can at that level, whether it be from trying to switch on the stem cell process, trying to switch on those chemical markers that are there in development that can actually enable rewiring and rerouting of connections. As I said, it doesn't take into account the fact that every brain is different. We're starting off here, but there's a whole flood of processing. So there is no way that this bionic system, this little control box that they put on your side can be matched for you and I for what we originally perceived. And maybe that doesn't matter. But for some people, that's the expectation. And this is just a classic example. You know, I know they're pretty simple illusions, but some of us will see a vase and some of us will see a face. And, you know, some people can't see that. And also the case here of, you know, the two people leaning forward, which actually is just an illusion. It's actually just pillars. You know, we get this different percept. Some people see different things from very simple objects. So it really does just tell you how basic this function is, because even in simple objects, we're actually perceiving different things. And we know that this information has to be at the behavioural level, ultimately, that it, can't, it isn't just about vision, and that there's actually a lot of integration between the different sensory systems. Like, I suppose visual and motor is one of those most complex or most feasible ones to identify with is, you know, someone throws you a ball, you catch it. So some of it actually creates some level of difficulty as well. And I think the one way you actually get the most difficulty is actually with speech and colour. So I want you to actually read out what the actual colour of the text is rather than the actual word. It's pretty difficult, isn't it? <laughs> but generally people have a lot of trouble with actually integrating this level of information. And that's where perhaps evolution hasn't worked that well. But that, I wanted to bring that up last because I think that's what I want to take away. Is we really don't know how maybe little bits of aspects of vision are processed. We do when it gets to that first phase. So thinking back from that initial input into the visual brain, quite a simple pathway. But then we've got to think about how it's structured with every other system as well. And I really can't ever see that happening outside of this. So can, coming back to that original question I want to finish off, 
Can a machine recapitulate human vision? And I believe not before we understand the complexity of the developmental process and integration at information at that neural level. I think we really need to understand what's happening in the biology before we can recapitulate this in the machine. So thanks very much. Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, we should open the floor up for a few minutes, just in case anyone has any questions for you. Sure. So we'll do five minutes of questions, and then okay. we'll go to the next speaker. Yep. You seem to be a bit aggressive against this idea of uh, machine prosthesis, because why wouldn't you do both things simultaneously? Try and understand better how the uh, system works at the same time, look for props. And blind, blind memories cane or an ultrasonic transducer for the visually impaired or anything like that. It's helpful up to a point. You don't expect everything of it. Sure. It may achieve something useful in the meanwhile. Yeah, okay. So I do come across quite aggressive and it's, I suppose there's, I'm being the devil's advocate to it as well, just to try and infuse debate around it as well. But the cases where it's happened in both the UK now and the US is people adapt. While I said to you that the brain isn't plastic in adulthood, it's not particularly plastic for the terms of repair, but there's adaption. People that have been blind for most of their lives actually adapt very well. You and I feel that someone walking around the street with a cane is quite difficult, but their whole brain has rewired to make the sense of somatosensory. They actually can perceive their environment in a way, and I think that's what we actually forget. Our perception of vision is what we're seeing in our everyday life. It doesn't mean that someone that's rendered blind doesn't have some sort of unconscious, non-visual part in their brain, like this integration of information. So what they're actually tuning into in terms of picking up from their feel and touch could actually create this sort of, in another centre of their brain, a sort of visual sensory modality. And I think changing that in people's life may not always be the ultimate thing. I think that, you know, there's been a lot of hope about what it can actually produce. And what people have said is that minimal information that it can give me is no better than what I'm capable of currently doing with touch and feel. There's another case of a guy that was blind early in life. I don't know if he, and he uses clicking now, echolocation, to actually sense his environment. And he actually gets a visual interpretation of the area from clicking. And that's another thing you can look up on Google. So what he does is he goes around, he makes a clicking noises, and he can actually map and draw for you what the environment's like that he's actually in. Isn't there, um, there's some sort of thing you get on the iPad or phone that senses the, the visual field, and um, it sends back in sounds and people learn how to distinguish. Mm -hmm. I saw that on a documentary. Yeah, 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 so sound is our second sense. So that's the thing, is people that are left blind are actually often... Sound, I'm sorry, sound then becomes a big auditory cortex becomes that primary information input. Now part of that is because in terms of where these systems lie in our brain, the auditory cortex actually expands into that visual part of the brain. And that's what they saw with that patient that I showed you with the um, lesions of his cornea early in life. They showed that what had been where he should be recognised his faces is actually now being taken over because it was, you know, plastic at that time by his auditory cortex. So we do tend to adapt, and that's what these prostheses aren't taking into account. They're thinking it's a hardwired system. Perhaps we need to get that adaption more focused. There are cases where people are blind that go around with a tongue implant with a camera. That was the first neural prosthesis that was used. So it actually has a bed of nails, uh, thousands of nails, and, and they actually wear it on their tongue. And it creates an environment in a, from this small camera and actually pick, gives you that impression. And they actually have a near normal life. They can walk around the street. Time magazine put that in one of its hundred failures. Really? As, as an invention of several years ago. Well, quite a few people have actually yeah. used it, so. Yeah. Yep. You mentioned something about those fMRI scanners and being able to map individual axons in a brain. Now that to me sounds pretty exciting. Uh, what level is that technology at? I mean, are we talking what genome sequencing was 10 years ago? So we can 
in the foreseeable future we could actually map our own? Well, you can now, yeah. So that technology is actually there. So what's been the stumbling block is actually not my field, but it's been in the technology of the scanning equipment themselves. So, of course, magnetism is measured in Tesla, so we've needed a much stronger magnet to actually enable this. The problem with it at this moment is that it's still a probabilistic, stochastic measure. So what it actually does is it measures in 60 different directions the likelihood of an orientation in one particular direction through that Brownian, Brownian motion, which we call fractional anisotropy. And then what it does is it takes that segment and then looks at the one next door. And then it creates this probability of them likely connecting through. So, yes, we can all get that done, and we use it in the scientific practice, but there's still a long way for it to be verified as an appropriate technique. Because it's where it comes down to the methodology and the paradigm that you actually used to calculate this. So Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, a number of universities are coming up now with their own individual platform for doing this, but we're really trying to look at this to find the best modality. Looking at the big global structures, it's very easy. So that qualitative sort of aspect of where that path's going to is there. It's when we come down to that quantitative level to say, well, that path's actually decreased, that one's increased, is where we're sort of like bottlenecked at the moment. But yes, you... Patients that have stroke, this will be done. DTI, it's called diffusion tractography imaging. So is that tracking things at a sort of a pathway level or at an axon axonal level? It's actually at the whole pathway, so it picks up one axon, but it doesn't. It's not directional selective, so it could be one going this way and one going back as well. Okay. Would you expect that the quality of those scans to improve? Absolutely, and I think the greatest thing is that in Australia we have that capacity now because the federal government have invested a lot around this technology so out at Monash we now have a nine Tesla small bore animal scanner that we can actually use to see this and this is giving us much more information about how these individual areas are connected that original diagram I showed you that flow chart was all done by sticking traces into the brain which get taken up by the neurons the cells and projected along the axon now we can literally go in there and actually look at you know this over a, in a temporal way because in the past it's had to be one animal for one different stage we can actually now take an animal from early life and we can do this with humans as well and start imaging them very early to see that sequential maturation so it's very exciting yes so question yep Absolutely, and I think, unfortunately, that's often the case that actually holds biological science up. And that's a very pertinent point. You know, a lot of what I originally started around gave Hubel and Weasel their Nobel Prize. And trying to turn the tides on Nobel laureates with your sort of work doesn't go down particularly well with the journals. So I'll tell you, some of the rejoinders I've had for publications which has been quite difficult, but we get there. It is a case that technology advances, it gives us a more open view of what's going on. Counter to that, though, I suppose, is it gives you that secondary level of validity because I think we're more precise about the science we do now because we know that we have to prove or disprove a hypothesis. It means that extra steps are required. So I think in the past where there's been an element of originally how the brain was mapped by Brobman, where literally he opened, you know, under surgery a human skull and started poking around and applying small voltages to different regions of the brain and looked at what the response was, and we've changed. But I think this is always going to be a case of technology. 
And whether this is just a phenomenon within the biological, neurobiological sector, I don't know, because there's certainly a lot that we could say about artificial intelligence. I'm sure James could tell us more about where think concepts have been thought to be true and then we've moved away from that. And we did hear a start to that earlier. That's right. All right. All right. Thank you very much.